But those 12 tribes were oftentimes at one another's throat. They were fighting one another. There was no unity for many of the years during the time of the judges. And even under Saul, though there was a certain unity obtained, there was nevertheless division because of Saul's own sinfulness and evil guidance. But under King David, you had the tribes of Israel serving God together. They had peace and prosperity in Israel. David had a fight. He was the fighter. He, as a type of Christ, fought against the opponents of God and His Word. He fought the enemy, and God gave him the victory. But David promoted unity within the nation of Israel. And so also we promote that unity in the church of Jesus Christ in the New Testament age. It's a unity again of believers, those who hold fast to the truths of God's word. And when we promote that, we enjoy the blessed fruits of such unity. That unity is carried out, of course, in worship. We hear the word of God. We sing together the praises of God. We come together in prayer and supplication to God, and it promotes a oneness in the church. And if we don't experience that, then there's something wrong. There's something wrong. That happens in churches. I don't know that much about you. It's been years since I've been here. And it's a pleasant thing to see you all again in some I've never seen before. But it's promoted in a unity of the church. And that unity is encouraged when we speak and act as one body of Christ. And as we look at that church, and as we think about it, behold the, that church, we say, that's the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, with Christ as the head. You notice how the Apostle, uh, how David speaks here of brethren. It's blessed of brethren to dwell together in unity. That's distinct from the word mankind. When men today, people today, speak of unity, they speak commonly of mankind. We're all one race or unity, united in humanity. One humanity of different sorts and kinds, but one humanity. So we have to all get along together. We have to all agree that we have rights. We have rights, if we wish, to abortion. We have rights, if we wish, to homosexuality and marriage as such. We have rights to do as we please on this earth as long as we don't interfere too much with the rights of others. That's mankind. Unity of mankind. The word of God here speaks of brethren with the brethren in Israel. They were the ones who enjoyed unity under King David and his reign. They enjoyed seeking out those who worshiped God in truth. They were the ones who came to the tabernacle and under Solomon to the temple to worship God through burnt offerings and sacrifices. They were the ones when Israel was faithful in observing the feast days that God had ordained for Israel. They were the ones who were ready to go to war against the enemies of Israel in order to defeat or destroy them. There's unity within the Church of Jesus Christ this way too. We don't go out and fight physically with unbelievers. We don't take up the sword against evil governments, but we object on the basis of Holy Scripture to that which is done contrary to the Word of God. We fight by way of our testimony concerning that Word. And if the world hates that, we're willing to suffer the consequences that may result. But we give good testimony to them. There is one way of salvation through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, but some say that will offend the Muslim or the Hindu. They have another religion. 
But they serve God too. Not the triune God, but they serve God in their own way. The child of God says there's one way of salvation through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That way alone. So the child of God in the church fights. And he's not deceived by the attempt to whitewash the ungodly so that they look rather nice after all. Some of the news broadcasts in the States have a segment almost every day that is called, What Works? What Works? And then they show certain people who go out of their way to help the poor, to take care of the sick, who give of themselves and give of their talents to encourage others. And the idea is they're good people. They're good people. Well, they do wonderful things, I suppose we would say. But the question is, why? Why do they do these things? They do it for the service of themselves sometimes. Sometimes they do it in order to gain prominence. They may catch the attention of the news commentator. They may do it simply because there is in themselves a desire to help other people. An altruism. But not do it to the glory of God. They do not and would not confess themselves to do it because of the work of Christ and His Spirit within the heart. And though men may praise such and exalt them to high heaven, the child of God says, but wait a minute. When you don't serve God in all that you do, don't do it out of that proper motive, then you're doing it in sin. And God will judge. It must be done according to the Word of God, out of true living faith, and in harmony with all the glory of God. That's the goodness that God requires. And so the child of God <clears throat> looks for unity and fellowship in Christ together. They look to carry out their deeds of testimony, of instruction to those within the church, and when opportunity arises, instructing those outside of the church, in order that God's name might be highly exalted and His kingdom may come. I say the church does all of these things to glorify the name of God. It fights with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's what you have to see. Behold, behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Do you see that here? Do you see it in your life and mine, that unity in which we rejoice always in God and His work and put ourselves down? By nature, we're corrupt despicable sinners, deserving of all of the wrath of God forever in hell. By grace, by grace alone, through the power of the Spirit, and on the basis of the cross, the child of God carries out the work of God to the glory of His name. That's, that's why you look at the church, not at individuals within the church to say well, how important that man is or that woman. But you look at the church to see the body of Christ and how important that is in the eyes of our God. The church is, after all, the apple of God's eye. That's a figure, a figure of speech. But it impresses upon us how important the church is to the sovereign God because he has purchased it through the blood of his only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why David says too, Behold how good and pleasant that is. And I ask as I began, do, do you really see how good and pleasant all of this is? It's good. It's good. 